praise and shout aloud to the lifter of our heads, to the rock we stand. Your salvation is our song, and we can't stay silent. We will sing how great is your love for us and great are the things you've done. Why don't you stand? Try with us, Lord. We come to worship you. Here we go. Lord, we come to worship you. Thy glory, come our hearts in awe. By your love, we are redeemed. We are yours and your love. Your salvation is our song. Now we can't stay silent. We will sing how great is your love. For us and great are the things you've done and praise is the offering we bring to you. All of our heart and soul and all that you are and for and praise is the offering we bring to you. verse again. Lord, we come. Lord, we come to worship you. Lord, we bow our hearts in all. By your love we are redeemed. We are yours and your love. Sing that again. We are yours. We are yours and your love. Sing out. We are yours. you and bear my cross. 
same together just one time evidence enough that God is great. The blind man said, I don't know what's going on. Jesus healed him and everybody was mad at him and they said, have you been blind since you were born and can you tell us what's going on? What did Jesus do to you? And he said, look, I don't know. I can't tell you anything, but I know this. I was blind. I couldn't see. Now I can see. He gave me my sight again. Some of us can say that. I mean, I was without hope uh, and I don't know what happened, but I put my trust in Jesus and he gave me hope that I never had before. I was without peace, and He gave me peace that I would, had never had before. Lord Jesus, we thank You that You do that for us. We thank You that You have grace for us, and that when we are blind, uh, You give us sight again. Lord, we thank You that You are a God who is in control and great and in charge of all things. There's not much that we know for certain, God, but we know, we know, we know that You are a great God and that You are full of grace and compassion and mercy for us. So we worship you tonight. Who has stretched out the skies like a canvas? Who has scooped up the oceans with his Measured the hills from the mountain. You have. Who has given us beauty for us? 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we praise you tonight and acknowledge tonight that it's only in you that we live and move and have our being. Lord, we pray that tonight in our hearts and in our minds that you will be greater than anything. Lord, when we think of the greatest thing we can imagine, I pray that always and only you would come to our mind. Lord, we worship you tonight. We want to hear from you tonight. So we open our hearts to you tonight. I pray that you give us light and life from your word. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as you find your seat, find your Bible, and go to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians, and we're going to look quickly tonight at four purposes of the church. And when we're going to pray for leaders, and we're going to pray for our church. Uh, we have a brief business, our quarterly business session. We're going to talk about uh, that for a few minutes. we got one item uh, to bring you that will take about three minutes, and uh, we'll get all of that uh, done tonight. Uh, but it's an important time we come together and uh, talk about transfer, new members, and old members, and that kind of stuff. But what are the four purposes, four purposes uh, of the church? Ephesians helps us with that, and I want to jump right into them, give them to you uh, tonight, and then I want us to spend a little while praying. Uh, over the church and praying over pastors and others that uh, need to be prayed for tonight. So let's, let's look at the church. The, the word church is an interesting word in the Greek New Testament. Uh, 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 ekklesia, that we see it, those that are called out. We're going to see that right here in Ephesians. We've been called out of darkness. And, and so when we're called out to be God's people, we gather together. Now let's think about the church. This, this is the Lord's Day, so let's just think about Sunday. The church is gathered all over the planet today. Okay? Amen. Now, uh, over where we travel to, uh, stands in Moldova just a few days ago, uh, some of those folks didn't meet in the cathedral today, did they, Stan? Boy, it came from some tough, tough places. There's some folks met under shade trees today around the world. There are people that, that met in beautiful buildings. Make this look like a cucumber, a uh, little like a, a keeper's hut in a cucumber patch, as Isaiah calls it. All right? Uh, it, it is a beautiful place. These uh, palatial places around the world. Then there are other little white frame buildings. And then mostly across our country, there are just small churches that dot the landscape. They're in cities, hamlets, villages, huge cities, suburbs. Uh, they're just that. And people gathered in all sizes of ecclesia today. The church. It, it just looks all, well, it's all different. But it all is the same. Because we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so the people of God, what is the purpose of the gathered people of God? Ephesians looks into this because he talks about the church a lot in the book of Ephesians, Paul does. So let's leave four things very quickly here tonight. Number one, the first purpose that I would share with you is found in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And that is to show forth Christ's fullness, to show forth Christ's Fullness. So look in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, where Paul says these words. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is a miniature of Christ. It is the fullness. As Christ is the head, then we are the body. In Ephesians 3 and, and verse 19, you, you read these words. To know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Filled up. To all the fullness. Look in chapter 4 and verse number 10. He who descended is himself. He also ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill, to fill up all things. The first purpose is to show forth Christ's fullness, that, that the fullness of Christ is in us. Now, the sad part is there are a lot of churches tonight where it's not Christ's fullness. It's the fullness of the flesh. Now, don't forget this. This is not your church. This is not my church. You got to be the head for it to be yours. 
and you're not the head. You're another part, but you're not the head. He said, we got hands and feet and legs and eyes and it takes all the parts to make the church. Somebody told me this week that this, there's only seven or eight really nasty people in the church. But they move around a lot. And they seem to show up, you know. But friend, it's not yours. It's his. And the church is to show forth not our fullness, but Christ's fullness. Brother Fred, I see you sitting over there. You know, the other night we went to Panama City. And uh, we, we went in Lizzie's car because we'd had that problem with the tire and the, all that. So I drove over as I normally do when I go preach. And then I have somebody with me and they drive back. If, if you ever go somewhere and you take Fred with you, you, he's an excellent driver pays attention to where you're going, but, but Brother Fred's a little ADD. That's attention deficit. Do you know when I got home, do you know how much gas we had when I got home? You're clueless, aren't you? My wife sent me to the gas station that night to put gas in. It's a wonder we didn't run out of gas. And neither one of us, because I was asleep, and Fred never looked at the gauge. It was laying over there at E flat minus 42. I'm telling you, it was, we was running on fumes, Brother Fred. I know a lot of churches running on empty, don't you? Because the flesh is what they're about. Friend, we don't run on our own strength. We are to show forth the fullness of the head. We're to be full The purpose of the church is to show forth Christ's fullness. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Number two, we, we are to show forth Christ's unity. Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 19. Look at this. Ephesians 2, 14. For he, that is Christ himself, is our peace, who made both groups. We've got to answer the question, what are the groups? He made both groups into one, and he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, what are the two, into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both, who are those two, in one body in God through the cross by by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have, we both, there's two again, who is that? That we have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. The first thing we do is show the fullness of Jesus. The second thing the church is to do is not to be divided. It's, it's to be unified. Now, here he's talking about two groups, two people in the first century in Ephesus. They were the people that believed Jew and Gentile in circumcision, non-circumcision. That you could be saved, but you had to be circumcised like a Jew. And another group that said, no, you could be saved, and you didn't have to have physical circumcision because he deals with that in verses 11, 12, and 13. But Christ is our peace. He's brought both of these groups together. He's, he's put us together, the Jew and the Gentile, the circumcised and uncircumcised, and he made one out of them. And the church today is to show love, kindness, cooperation between, uh, between the genders, between the races, and between the nationalities. You see, Jesus tears down division. And he brings unity in the body of Christ. Now you think about all those churches that met all the way around the globe today. Friend, they don't all look like us. As a matter of fact, when you get to heaven, there's going to be more people that don't look like us than do look like us. 
Because there's more folks that don't look like us than are look like us. The church is going to be real brown when you get to heaven. It is. Now, people like me, I'll be a superstar with this red hair. I mean, you, you know, I, I will just absolutely stand out like a rock star. Everything will be so brown and dark. Amen. They'll probably make me run fetch stuff. That's what that'll be happening. I'm just simply telling you that the church doesn't just look like us. What Jesus is, he brings us all together. The genders, male and female. He brings every race, every nationality, he brings us together. I, I was really, I'm always encouraged when I drive up on Sunday afternoon because the Russian church that meets here is getting out when I'm coming in. It always shocks people when, when I speak about a Russian congregation in Pensacola, Florida. He shocks me. I didn't, you know, I mean, who, who, you just don't think, Pensacola, Russians, do you? I mean, you really don't. Uh, but that group of people that have moved here from Kazakhstan and Moscow and Russia and then came many of them from the Washington state area and wound up moving here and, and have become our friends and, and they have a, a great core group. As a matter of fact, the people that meet over there on Sunday afternoon, uh, there's as many of them, uh, they would be the size of the average Southern Baptist church that met across America today. And when I got out today, the Russian pastor who speaks very little English when I got out of my car, he was standing there, and he just happened to be standing there, and he, he stopped, and he clicked his heels like a soldier and saluted, and I came in. Pastor, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. <laughs> Hugged my neck. God makes us one. He unifies us. Even when we don't have the same language, he, he makes us one. Well, here he's brought the Jew and Gentile together, those that argued over circumcision. And made them one. Don't miss it. The purpose of the church, show forth Christ's fullness. Number two is to show forth Christ's unity. Number three, it is to show forth Christ's wisdom. Wisdom. Look at it in Ephesians 3, 9, 10, and 11. In the third chapter, 9, 10, and 11, Paul says, And to bring to light what is the administration of the mysterion, of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So that the manifold, here it is, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And this is in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus supernaturally opens our eyes to the truth. And he shows in that the difference between eternal wisdom and temporal foolishness. Now hear me again. Jesus supernaturally opens the windows of our heart and of our eyes to show us the difference in eternal wisdom and temporal foolishness. Many a church today is running on temporal foolishness rather than on eternal wisdom. The church is to show forth Christ's wisdom. There's a different philosophy, a different game plan, different thought process. The way he just, it's backwards. The truth of God often is, is just, if, if you want to have and receive, if you want to have, what do you do? You give it away. That doesn't make any sense, does it? If you want to have, you, you give. That's just what the Word of God says. Jesus taught us that. If you want to be first in line, what do you do? You go to the back end. I never do that. You ever fly southwest? They line you up. A, B, C, D. And there's 1 through 60 and A, 1 through 60 and B, 1 through 60 and C. And, and you get on, you get any seat you want. They don't sign you a seat. So the farther you are at the front of the line, better off you are as far as getting a seat. But in God's economy, 
D60 is, is seat number one. You don't get to put your bag up. You got to check it. You're going to get a center seat between two big people. Okay? It just is. If you, if you want to be first, you, you, you be last. If, if you want to have, you, you, you give away. Friend, if we ever grab hold of seeing the eternal truths against temporal foolishness, we'll show forth the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. There's also a place in here for saving, for having a great financial plan. But you got to be a generous people. There's also a place to, to put back and prepare and plan. Well, if you just get in this book, you, you, you will find in the church it, it is to run on eternal truth. And the church should show forth wisdom. Not Well, too many times we see foolishness in the church. And the community sees us as foolish people. The way we take care of our affairs. And we need to have this eternal wisdom. And that's what the church is to show forth in the community. Number one, we show forth Christ's fullness. Number two, we show forth Christ's unity. Number three, we show forth Christ's wisdom. Wisdom, And number four, the purpose of the church is to show forth Christ's glory. His glory. Chapter 3 and verse 21. To him be the, say it out loud, glory, glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever Man, to him, that is to God the Father, be doxa, glory, in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. Now the question is, how does he get glory in the church? His glory in music. We lift him up. Amen. When we pray, we had four men pray here a while ago. We should give him glory when we pray, shouldn't we? We don't pray to ourselves, Lord, thank you for what we've done. No. We petition him. We thank him for what he's done. We, we give him glory. Well, when somebody comes and is saved in a service, who gets the glory for that? God does, the, the Savior. When, when somebody's baptized and they've taken their stand for Christ, who should get the glory? God should get the glory. He changed the, the person's life. You see a great victory in in the church of of restoration, of people being put together. Who gets the glory? God gets the glory for that. Let let there be glory. And and the church should show forth Christ. We should glorify Him. It should be all about Him. That's what the church is here for. We lift Him up. We glorify Him. We glorify Him. We glorify Him. Lift Him up. I, I, I encouraged you to read a book many months ago. Now it's called The Invested Life. If you've not read Rosenberg's in Koshi's book, The Invested Life, I challenge you to get this book and read. It's a great book on making disciples. You're going to hear more and more about this coming out of our Vision 25 team. And one of the big things you're going to be hearing about is that we've got to be a better disciple-making church than we've been in days gone by. We, we've got to be better and more strategic and pointed and, and better at making those disciples. In, in this book, Ro, Rosenberg talks about the local church. And, and let me just... I'm just going to read to you and insult your intelligence for a few minutes, okay? The local church should be global-minded, deeply committed to obeying the great commandments and fulfilling the great commission by preaching the gospel and making disciples of all the nations. We all agree with that. Number two, the local church should be multicultural, welcoming people of different races and ethnicities. You can say amen anywhere you want to. The local church should have strong, mature believers who exercise their spiritual gifts to build up the body of believers. The local church should have leaders of various backgrounds, racially, ethnic, and cultural. The local church should do everything with one accord in mind and in purpose. The local church should be led by the Holy Spirit. The local church should be a worshiping church, practicing corporate worship. Amen. Did you hate, don't you hate dead church? We had pretty good church this morning, Brother John. That's good, wasn't it? And we had new songs and old songs. 
We had old singers and young singers. We had old preachers and no other kind. <laughs> well, we only had one, so I mean, you know, that was it. The local church should demonstrate the grace of God in practical ways. Now listen to this again. The church, the local church should demonstrate the grace of God in practical ways. Showing grace. Mm -hmm. The local church should be a caring and compassionate church. You know, you all care for people. The local church should send out mighty missionaries like Paul and Barnabas, said Rosenberg. It ought to be a sending church. Aren't you glad this morning to see a, a young deacon come up and say, God's called me to ministry and I'm, I'm ready to go? Ready to go? David King, yeah, sending out. For those of you in early church, David and I just got our wires crossed. He was not at the hospital with his wife having a baby. Uh, he was here in the second service, and, and she was here. Yeah, amen. <laughs> tomorrow, they're inducing labor. Going to have that baby tomorrow. Yeah, amen. And lastly, he said the local church should be a praying, fasting church that continuously seeks and does the will of God. 